Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening, wherever you are on the world. So welcome to this week's event on secrets management. It's going to be a very interesting session with real life stories and examples of how it goes with secrets management when you try to implement it within an organization. So for today's session, uh, today we have the kickoff uh, and today you will get access to the course and the hands-on labs. And then one week later, uh, so that's next Monday at four o'clock CET, uh, we will have a wrap-up session. Uh, and this wrap-up session is meant for you to give us feedback on the course as well on the platform. And for the people that do make the time for, for this wrap-up and uh, join our um, yeah, wrap-up session, we will have a 100% discount coupon available for those people for any next course. So make sure you, you join us and, and help us uh, by improving the, the platform and the course, and you'll be awarded with a free next course. Uh, this is very important to us uh, because the feedback allows us you know, to improve the course as well as the platform. So if you are able to complete the hands-on lab, you'll be awarded with a practitioner certificate. Uh, it will mention your name uh, and also uh, it will mention exactly what you did and at what time and what date. And then you can probably show that, that you have really hands-on skills in secrets management in this case. So my name is uh, Dominic de Smit. Uh, I'm the CEO of DesicOps Academy. Um, I have a background in software engineering and cybersecurity, and I've helped a large number of organizations uh, with their security awareness and secure development, as well as any other security programs. Uh, so currently, I am trying to uh, uh, build this wealth of knowledge, and we try to put this in a platform. Uh, we call it the DevSecOps Academy, and we have a whole team that builds courses with us, and as well as the worldwide community. So we try to really make sure that people uh, get hands-on in secure DevOps or DevSecOps as fast and efficiently as possible. But uh, we will not talk too much today about DevSecOps Academy, but about the topic of today, secrets management. Uh, it's a really important topic uh, in DevOps and mostly um, you know, not focused upon enough, and also, it's quite a difficult topic, um, but we have an expert here today on the call that has successfully helped implementing it in one of the largest uh, enterprises, uh, financial institutions in the Netherlands. And we are very happy to have her today on this call. Sarah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Cool. Hi. So who is Sarah? Who is Sarah? Wow, <laughs> that's a very existential question. Um, no, so my name is Sarah. I'm the secrets management architect for ABN AMRA, um, which is one of the largest consumer banks here in the Netherlands. Um, I started with ABN AMRO as an advocate. And then as we expanded the secrets management use case, we realized that there was a lot more going on and we probably needed to have um, a broader overview of what was actually going on in terms of secret, secret management. Um, so a little bit of background for you. I started as a software engineer, um, mostly yeah, um, React and JavaScript frameworks. And then while I was doing um, some of that work, I realized that there was a really large disconnect between the security of an application versus, um, you know, the, the functionality of the application. And that really drew me into this kind of world of security. And at, at that point in time, um, I actually didn't know that DevSecOps was a thing or that it really existed. I guess it was probably about five-ish years ago now. Um, but I started looking more into cybersecurity and how it worked and um, eventually decided to go ahead and get a master's um, in cybersecurity. And while I was doing my master's, DevSecOps came up and I was really excited that there was this kind of world going on where 
you had the tech and the security kind of rolled into one another. Um, and that's kind of where I ran into Dominic and we started talking and talking about secrets management. And here we are today talking about secrets management. Um, I do have to say that when I started secrets management, my first thought was, this is really straightforward. Why do you actually need anyone to do just secrets management? It seems like, yeah, if you put it in a vault, it's secure, what happens? Like there, there can't be that much to it. But the more I've kind of gone down this path and really made it sort of my niche, um, it turns out there's a lot more going on. Um, there are many more things that you really need to consider when setting up your secrets management. Um, and we'll go into some more of those things as we go along. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So I'm looking really forward to your story. So for the people who are joining in, uh, if you have any questions in the meantime or during the presentation, please and, uh, ask them in the chat. And then uh, we can see how we can incorporate them or even uh, at the end, you know, go into a further discussion on them. Um, I hope uh, that uh, I saw that there was some issue regarding the screen sharing, but that should be now fine. Uh, now it should be the, the correct slides. So sorry for that. So uh, Sara, uh, let me see if I can go to the next one. And uh, I think we can skip uh, this one and dive straight into it, right? Indeed. All right, so I live my life based off of the assumption that there are no assumptions. Um, so I really wanna make sure that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, when we look at, let's say old school um, data and security, what we're really looking at is this kind of castle and moat idea, right? So we had this idea that the security was all on the exterior, it was hard, anything that was on the interior could be trusted more or less. Um, and that was because we really didn't need to keep track of what was connected to the internet. Everything that spoke to each other was set up that way. It was fine, we could deal with that, it was no problem. Um, sometimes we call it the castle and moat security model. Um, I've also heard it called the M&M security model because it's like hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Next slide. But then we started looking at cloud and by default, cloud is connected to the internet. It's just how it's created. Um, it's what makes it so powerful. It's what makes it so useful um, because it's highly configurable and we can do what we need with it. Um, our performance increases, our costs decrease if we use it properly. Um, but then that really starts creating this issue where if you don't configure it quite properly, that everything can talk to each other. And here, uh, you start really seeing where the security issues lie because each one of these little clouds sort of has its own attack surface. Um, if you can get into one of those, then there's a pretty decent chance that you can move laterally. Um, and when we're talking about secrets management, that means that you could in theory extract these secrets from one cloud to another just by moving laterally and getting access to one. And then we thought it would be a really great idea to make that even more complicated. Um, and so we started using containers. And within this multi-cloud environment, um, we have these smaller extractions of, uh, you can call it virtual machines, but you have these smaller extractions of um, software and infrastructure that really permit us to have a whole new layer of attack surface. So now we're not just dealing with multiple clouds that have to communicate with each other, but have to communicate with each other securely. We have multiple clouds that need to communicate securely, but also somehow we have to figure out how to deal with this really ephemeral, ever-changing security um, and environments that you know we can't necessarily assign them a specific identity. Um, and that, that makes for some pretty profound challenges um, because especially as we see security move towards this sort of zero trust model, how are you going to maintain your identity so that you're 
environments can properly authenticate to each other, but not lose this really valuable sort of ephemeral architecture. Next slide. So what we're talking about today, um, you know, sometimes we can say, sometimes people say secrets and when they say secrets, it can mean um, confidential data, um, things like uh, passport or uh, bank account numbers, things like this. Um, we're gonna leave those things aside today. And what we're really gonna talk about are um, this lifecycle management for pieces of information that are used for authentication and authorization of workloads, right? So we wanna make sure that with secrets, with proper secrets lifecycle management, that the only workloads that are specifically authenticated and authorized can gain access to each other and are allowed to speak to each other. Um, and we, the way we do that and the way we look at doing that um, is really initiating this identity-based trust. So it's no longer about this global trust where we logged in to a server and then everything was trusted as long as it was in that network environment. No, we're saying you have to have the proper identity. I don't care what network you're in. I don't care what you're doing. You have to have that identity. Um, and then after you've initiated that authentication or that authorization, we need to authenticate that. We need to make sure that you are who you say you are and we wanna be sure that you can do what you say um, or what we think you should. Um, so that means we have to enforce this principle of least privilege, right? So you only get as much access as you, are, you need to do your job, nothing more and nothing less. If we give you too much, you can, yeah, do some harm to the system in theory. If I give you too little, well, you can also find yourself in a little bit of a situation where you have um, like a DOS situation. Um, and then how are we going to enforce this kind of role-based access control? Based off of specific roles, if I'm an admin, but I'm trying to perform a particular role, an upgrade or um, a restore, I don't need to have full access to all of these secrets. I just need access to the permissions that are going to permit me to do that job. So how do I enforce this kind of role-based access? Um, and then how are you gonna rotate those secrets? Um, I think you know one of the largest attack vectors that we, we see just daily and in general are like admin, admin, right? So username and password, admin, admin. And that's because these things didn't get rotated properly. Um, so you can just use them systematically across the board for an indefinite amount of time. Um, so what we really wanna control is how long are these active for? How do they get changed? Um, what gets changed and when? And then the last thing that we'll kind of look at a little bit is this audit trail. Um, if I'm looking at, well, basically, if I don't know what's going on, then I'm, I'm not going to be able to see anything. Um, and we want to know if the connection is successful, but we also really want to know if the, success, if the connection is not successful. If it's not successful, that's an indicator to us that maybe somebody's trying to access the system who shouldn't be accessing the system, um, or conversely, there's a problem with the configuration and the way that we've set up the automation. Um, and then, you know, to make this as humanly difficult as possible, we want to make sure that this is all automated. Um, so setting up the automation obviously is difficult, but then it takes a lot away from us and it takes away this portion of human error that can happen. Um, if it's not automated, because if we're trying to manage all of this manually, there's a pretty large uh, possibility that we're going to, we'll do something wrong, that it's just human nature there will be an error. Next one. And the reason behind all of this, um, we really wanna protect our assets. Um, and those assets can be financial and tangible, um, but I think something that's overlooked quite often is this reputational asset. Um, 
you know, I can get money back into the bank, but if I damage my reputation because I am using user, username and password and admin admin, yeah, that, that's harder to come back from. And you can see things like this happening um, with Capital One in the US, it happened, um, and some other places where just these default passwords weren't changed. Um, and then coming back from that and becoming a trusted entity again, it's really difficult. Um, also, as we move on, we see that there's more compliance frameworks and things that we need to adhere to. Um, so by implementing secrets management, it's much easier to kind of prove this compliance and remain compliant throughout. Um, um, so yeah, you can see this with PCI DSS, which is the financial institution um, for credit cards. They say you need to prove like be able to audit all of your users. And as you have microservices and these things evolve, those services become greater in number um, and harder to trace. So it's having the secrets management solution in place is gonna help you with that auditability also. We wanna make sure we get the secret sprawl out of there. Um, we wanna know where secrets are at, at all times. Um, so if my colleague revokes a password, um, he wants to know exactly where that password is going to be and who's using that password at all times. And if secrets are sprawled, then we have a little bit of a problem. And, you know, uh, Sally in the cubicle, you know, two cubicles over may start screaming because all of a sudden her access is revoked and we don't really know who else may have had their access revoked. Um, likewise, Decentralized management, if I have hundreds of secrets over different vaults, I really don't have any overview on what's going on there. And I'm gonna have a little bit of a a little bit of trouble trying to track those down and make sure that they get rotated properly, that if there's a breach, that they're all revoked. Um, so getting it into the same spot is gonna help with that. Um, we want to eliminate the hard-coded secrets. It seems like a given. Um, but you know, regularly you see things like GitHub and um, AWS, you know, newsletters and things say don't publish these things. Um, it happens. It happens a lot. Um, there's a lot of crypto mining that happens as a result. Um, so yeah, <laughs> let's get it out of there. And then also, you know, how are you going to secure and automate the certificate distribution, especially for ephemeral workloads? If you're using um, Kubernetes secrets, well, they're not really secure, right? They're just base encoded or base 64 encoded. So we want to make sure that all of these things are happening and things are like really secure. Um, and within AB and Emro, we decided to start all of this with the containerized solutions. Um, so I guess we jumped into the deep end <laughs> um, and really went for the most complex of the situations. But that's also where we thought there was the most um, value in what we were doing. Next. So sorry, if I can maybe ask a quick question before we go to the next slide. Um, you mentioned here about eliminating the hardcoded secrets, mm -hmm. right? And the secret in Git repos. Yep. Um, what would you say? Because you know, teams have hardcoded secrets. Uh, they do see. I mean, they read the news, mm -hmm. right? So they know what can happen. Yep. Um, but what would you say is the you know is the most effective way to get this awareness out for these teams, yeah, and and to really uh, have them you know understanding or, or get them to a, a level of understanding that they really also prioritize this, right, and that they understand how important it can be. Uh, what what did you find was the most uh, effective way of, of doing that with teams? Um, I think you're seeing more and more tooling. Um, things like GitHub, uh, GitLab, they're starting to roll out this scanner. Um, so that it kind of checks for basic patterns for um, secrets that are, are that are stored in the code and then it won't commit. Um, and I think that's a really effective way to do it. Um, you know, I can say that I'm, I'm guilty of it myself that I've put some sort of secret into code and I've just totally forgotten that it's there. I don't think it's malicious um, but I think a pre-check is really a valuable thing to have there. Okay, yeah, and I guess the easier it, it becomes, 
right? The 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 easier it is for teams to uh, to yeah, not make the mistake. We have a secrets management solution in place that's fully automated and um, just really easy to consume. Then teams don't have this need to store things in their code um, no. or use it directly in the code. It's just an API, simple API call that's available from you know all of your different or all of your different environments um, and are just able to consume straight out like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for the inter interruption there, Sarah. Let's uh, let's go to the next uh, next slide. Um, so when we're looking at you know the evolution of secrets management and just um, this is a Gartner um, uh, yeah like the Gartner maturity model, um, you can kind of see what you're looking at when you're looking at secrets management. And I think from my point of view and what I've seen when you're doing secrets management, there's this conception that it's all about tooling. Um, and you can kind of see how Gartner looks at that and says, okay, tool secrets or uh, tool centric secrets management, we're gonna call that a level two because yeah, okay, you're doing things what you need to do, but it's not, you're not fully mature. Um, and for me, once I start looking at secrets management in general, it becomes more about your entire program. How are you managing those secrets from the time they're placed um, to the time that they need to be revoked? And that can be revoked dynamically, that can be revoked um, programmatically, but what's really going on? Do you have a full understanding of what this entails? Um, and then getting that rolled out into the enterprise itself um, I would say is also part of that maturity model. And how does um, the enterprise see how that's working out for them? Um, for me, like I say here, um, I think the proper rotation um, and secrets transport are really probably the, the most disconcerting um, in terms of attack vectors. Um, if you just have a secret that's securely stored, yeah, it can be relatively securely stored, but then if you're transporting it and it can be intercepted and it's not properly rotated, then you still have a pretty large problem. Um, it can still be used to access your system. And if you don't know that that's happened or you, know, you don't mitigate that in any way by rotating it and making sure that that secret is then out of play, um, you still have, you've still opened up your, your attack surface. Um, and then again, once you look at this containerization, you're really looking at a greater need um, for a cohesive solution because it's so dynamic, it's always changing. Um, and there are many things about containerization that are still relatively immature. Um, you know, like we said earlier, the, the Kubernetes secret, yeah, it's just base 64 encoded. So if I'm on the inside of a cluster, and I have access to those Kubernetes secrets, then yeah, I might as well have access to your alt as well. Next. Um, so when I started with ABN MRO, we were just starting to adopt vault um, or HashiCorp vault, I guess I should be more explicit. Um, and it was, yeah, it was quite a challenge. There's not a lot of information out there about best practices. Um, I think there's a single OWASP paper and then everything else that you find is really vendor specific. So I can find Hashi's point of view, I can find CyberArk's point of view, um, but where are like the best practices and what needs to happen with secrets management? It's, it's not super clear um, also in terms of architecture because I can give you architecture in a best world scenario, but when you're working, you know, for larger corporations with really complex and highly regulated systems, those of you who have done it know that it never goes smoothly. <laughs> um, so it took us quite a while to get Vault up and running. Um, we started on AWS and then um, for some security reasons and also for connectivity reasons, um, we said, yeah, okay, the way that the architecture model is set up, just it doesn't support Vault in this way. Um, and then the bank changed its strategy. So we moved to another platform and we were able to go ahead and implement that in a way that was highly connectable for all of the teams and then start really just 
automating it. Um, and we automated pretty much everything that we can. So now we have a system where anytime anyone kicks off uh, their Kubernetes cluster or builds their Kubernetes cluster, um, they're automatically onboarded into Vault. So they really don't feel anything. They don't need to know how it works. Um, currently, we're working largely with static secrets and we're moving into this dynamic secrets. Um, and that has a lot to do with the mindset and the comfort level of people. Um, dynamic secrets start to get a little bit complex and to throw that at somebody with a new tool, what I found is it can be a lot to swallow. So we went ahead and we just started with the stat static secrets. We said, okay, we're happy that we're at least bringing up the security level a little bit um, in terms of secrets management. Um, so let's start there. And then we're going to start moving into these dynamic secrets. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense, about a year ago, we had two, two clusters onboarded, one of them actively using Vault. Um, and now we're sitting at a 73% adoption rate. So that means 73% of all clusters, um, regardless of what environment they're running in, um, whether that be development or production, um, they're using Vault in some capacity. Um, and what's really neat is that we've seen this like shift. Um, when we started Vault, it was a lot of, no, it's secure, it's a great tool, we like it, here's why, it's highly configurable, it's all API based, and um, there was quite a bit of pushback. And now we're starting to see people come to us and say, okay, so here's our use case, how would you handle it? Um, so it's really starting to grow and it's growing to the point where now we can go ahead and start approaching those dynamic secrets and those automated dynamic secrets. Um, and teams are coming to us and asking, you know, how, how they can work with us to get this all automated um, and in place. Um, like I said, that secrets management is a program. It's not about the tooling. Um, tooling is important. You have to have a good tool like with anything but you have to understand what's at play for secrets management. Um, and if you don't, then you're gonna have a lot of pushback and people are going to want to just do what they're familiar with. You know, secrets in a vault, I'm gonna pull it into my code um, and yeah, you're gonna have a hard time evolving that secrets management program. Next. Like I said, you can move on. Um, so I think one of the most challenging parts about our Vault implementation um, really has to do with getting these policies implemented, um, defining what the various roles are, what do we need for those specific roles, um, what capabilities do those roles have to have, um, and then making sure that there's not too much privilege left there. Um, also, um, testing has actually turned out to be incredibly important for this, um, largely because we have our assumptions about what various endpoints are, can do. Um, but if you, yeah, take those um, and run some unit tests against them and see what actually happens, sometimes it's not quite what you anticipate. Um, and that can be positive or negative. Um, but it's just, you need to know what's going on. Um, so in this case, um, I've said, yeah, you have a, an app that just needs to read the database credentials. Um, and again, I may have been guilty of doing this in life. Um, just to be sure that my programming is going to go smoothly, I'm just going to give it a few more permissions. Next. Um, so again, this is HashiCorp Vault specific. Um, and this is actually a vulnerable policy here. Um, it's written in HCL, which is HashiCorp language. Um, and my assumption here is that if I put the wildcard on secret, then I'm going to be able to create, update, read, and list. Well, first of all, we see that there's an issue because I really shouldn't be able to create or update because what I really just need to do is read because this is for my cluster, right? Um, 
what is also problematic in this case is that this is a destroy path. So if I say secret destroy, and then I can create or update, then I can destroy the secret. And what that means then is that in order to bring this back um, or get my secret back, I would actually have to do a full backup and restore. Can we hit the next one, Dominic? So this is actually what I want. And you see how it's a lot more specific. I'm telling it that I want the data and I want it on my app. And then after that, that's great. You can read whatever you want, but that's all I want. Next. Um, and how I kind of establish whether I want, I want how much, um, regulation or the type, how do I determine that is um, via this trust calculation. Um, and this was actually put out by the Intel Corporation in 2012. And it's really just kind of narrows it down for you and makes it a little bit more explicit. So in order to determine whether I can trust a source or not, I want to know who it is, what does it have, and where is it? Um, so in the case of like Kubernetes, um, I want a who, so the identity, but then what do you have? In this case, you have a jot, so I want that. And I wanna know where you're coming from. So where is your IP? Then on the destination side, I also want to be sure that it knows who I am and what do I want? So in this case, I want, a specific secret. And then where is that data located? So I want to know that it has that explicit location. Um, and then based off of these three different things, you can say, okay, we're going to deny access, we're going to allow access, or we're going to allow conditional access. Um, because maybe you have two out of three things and that's good enough for read, but in order for you to update, I need you to have all three things and be able to prove all th three things that say, you know, who you are, what you're doing, where you are, and all of the places that you're going, the requirements for where you're going. Next. Um, and something, another consideration that I like to take into account is the pull, don't push. Um, so anytime that I can find a way to get the information out of something, um, I'm going to do that. So I, basically what I don't want to do is use the client side to put the information in. I can use the client side to trigger an event, um, but I'm not necessarily, yeah, I don't want to use the client side to put information in. And that's basically because um, there are a couple things that can happen. I can just use the client side pushing information in to create um, too much noise essentially on the server um, and create sort of a DDoS or a DOS. Um, if I use an event to trigger it, it's a little easier for me to throttle and say, okay, this is just going crazy or you know, a single event is enough to go ahead and use as a trigger. Um, but also it's really easy to spoof a client. Um, if you turn up and say, hey, I am who I say I am, and you're just like, okay, great, sure. Um, and that information gets inserted. Um, yeah, there's a potential that there could, um, that could initiate attack in that case. Um, and then if I go ahead and I pull, then I know that whatever I've, registered or however I've securely registered my server, um, it's gonna go in um, and it provides a lot less opportunity for spoofing. Um, so I have a certain base of information on my server side. My server says, okay, I know that I need to go to this point to get this information, pull it out. So at least you know that you're going to um, the designated source that you have already pre-identified um, and configured in order to be able to to make that a legitimate thing. Um, it also gives you more control over your traffic. 
so then you can be sure that things are, you know, throttled properly or um, the flow is more fluid or, you know, there are a hundred different cases, but you have the control. Um, it's just really trying to avoid giving that client control. Next one. Um, and like, yeah, I think the most important pointer that I can give you is really just that the secrets management adoption is not linear. Um, for every two steps forward we took, we took easily a step back. Um, you know, we started with an installation of vault and we were super excited and it was ready to go. And then, you know, we realized there's not a whole lot of connectivity. Um, we had a little bit of an issue with that. And then we came up with another solution. And then for other technical reasons, that solution failed. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And it's just really been this whole kind of fluid journey in a lot of ways. Um, but it also helps you realize that it's really about the agility and how do you make your solution agile enough that if one of your components or one of the things that your installation revolves on or your solution or um, even say your, you know, your client changes, um, how are you gonna manage that? And how can you be sure that if one thing breaks, you can get that back up and running um, relatively easily? Um, and also that the detection time is quite small. So if something breaks, how are you going to detect that something's broken? Um, and how are you going to look at the overall solution to make sure that it's, I guess, a little modular in some aspects? Um, so you have, you know, a pipeline that explicitly does one thing. And if that pipeline breaks or changes or something changes, then you just have to tweak that one little thing. Um, and for me, I think that's been quite a large realization about the security world and the DevSecOps world in general, is that if you try to group everything into this kind of monolithic security, you know, as of the days of yore, um, it's, it's just not gonna work. Um, it's really about segmenting things, really following that cycle and understanding how all of the different puzzle pieces kind of fall together. Next. Yeah. So that's a lot of our journey and some of the pointers that I can help you out with a little bit. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. I turned my chat. Yeah. So guys, everyone who's in, girls and guys, this is your opportunity to ask Sarah questions um, because uh, yeah, the journey has been interesting, uh, Sarah, also from your slides. This is you know clearly visible, and uh, it's just too much detail for you know to discuss everything in uh, in in this time frame. No, um, it's, it's taken me two years to figure it all out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So if anyone has any questions, now is the time to, to ask them. Uh, we will wait a, a few uh, seconds, uh, see if any, anything comes up in the chat. Um, you know, and then uh, we can still answer these questions or have a discussion uh, on them. And otherwise we will slowly continue and then there will be also some possibility later on again, of course. No questions as of now, so let's slowly continue. So, of course, uh, you know, this was a great story and uh, Sarah has been one of the fellows uh, on the DevSecOps Academy and she has created a course around secrets management, you know, for you to be able to start and to really get, you know, a feeling of, you know, what is secrets management and how does that work with my applications. So let me quickly uh, stop sharing the presentation and share the platform. So my web browser.
So you should be able to see my web browser now. So we are talking about uh, this course, of course, the secrets management for your applications. So when I go to the information page, uh, you can clearly see that Sarah is being mentioned as an author. Um, there is some uh, information around the course. Um, and uh, we also have a 30 seconds uh, whiteboard video, a little bit longer, that explains what you will be doing exactly in this course. And once you uh, click on continue or you start the course, you will see that there are two sections. So there is a preparation, preparation lab, sorry for that, on the left side and a hands-on lab on the right side. So first of all, you know, in order to, to prepare you well for the hands-on lab, you can start with the preparation lab. So as you can see, there are uh, a few steps that you will be going through where we will be explaining a little bit more or Sarah will actually uh, will be explaining a little bit more about secrets management, what is it actually, and some more resources for you to read on more in depth. And then at the end of the preparation lab, you'll be given an opportunity to either take a quiz to see, okay, you know, did you uh, grasp the, the, you know, the main topics of the preparation lab? And otherwise you can also continue into the hands-on lab. So once you start with the hands-on lab, I already started it up just before the, uh, this meeting. But when I press on continue, you see I am getting into the hands-on lab. And for this hands-on lab, we have prepared a few resources. Uh, as you can see here, there is a GitLab machine. There is actually a vault being spinned up. If I click on that, you can see that we are going into the vault that specifically has been you know, uh, set up uh, for you for this course. And then also a GitLab machine uh, that will hold uh, an application, a sample application, and you will also find the credentials here to log in into that, into that GitLab instance. And from there on, you can see here in the left side, there will be a few exercises that you will be going through and doing, and, and you will do them. Uh, there are also hints and uh, solutions available. So if you get stuck, you know, we will help you make sure that you will be able to go forward because the most important here is, is that you get this hands-on experience and the hands-on knowledge. As you can see also from the right top, there is a timer running down. So for this hands-on lab and for the hands-on labs in the secrets management course, you will have three hours available. So that doesn't mean that you will need the three hours, but that means that you have a maximum of three hours to complete them. So don't start uh, the hands-on lab and go grocery shopping because then the time will run out. So you will need to finish the hands-on lab within three hours. Um, we also have an automated checking uh, uh, system in place that will make sure that you keep on the right track. So as you can see here on the left side, there are a few exercises. And when I go to the next exercise, you see that a message pops up. Yeah? So this is a kind of, you know, a guardrails system. So it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, if you if that system says that you're not on the right track, that you shouldn't continue at all. It just means that we have detected something, you know, that might be different than we normally would expect. Uh, but don't get, you know, uh, don't get hold off uh, by that. Uh, if you're sure that you're, in the, uh, you're doing the right things, then continue until the end. And once you read the end, uh, once you read the end, uh, reach the end step, there will be a button for you to press and to submit the lab for review. Also at the end, uh, we will have a survey uh, link, as you can see here, there will be a step, you know, that asks, uh, asks you to provide feedback and, you know, feedback is really important to us. Um, so, you know, make sure that you spend some time on filling in this, this survey and some questions. Um, we didn't put too many questions in, but, you know, it's really important for us uh, to be able to give, uh, to get your feedback to, you know, improve the course and the platform. So that's a little bit the platform and uh, you know how it looks and of course you'll have much more time exploring it after this session so let's quickly go back to the presentation and if i share it again and by the way if you have any questions regarding this you know also uh you know uh, uh write them in the chat you know or, or let us know so we can answer them so um, I hope that everyone uh, you know, liked this session uh, about secrets management. Uh, I definitely did. Uh, I think it's always valuable to get insights from a person in the field 
uh, doing the topic and implementing and having the challenges uh, itself. So thank you very much, Sarah, for the presentation and uh, having you on board today, uh, you know, presenting your story. My pleasure. Um, and I hope we will uh, also see you in any future uh, events. So if you didn't register yet, you know, go to the, uh, go to the DevSecOps Academy. There will also be a link here in the chat. Um, and if there are no further questions for people in the audience, uh, then I would like to thank you already uh, very much for joining the session. And I hope you will have lots of fun doing the course and the hands-on labs. Um, and we hope, of course, to see you in the wrap-up session. So thank you very much.